tuned into Quick Charge, the high voltage podcast bringing you the top stories in electric vehicles and sustainable energy daily. And it's all powered by electric. Welcome to Quick Charge. It's August 7th, 2024, and I'm your host, Joe Boris. We're going to start today off with exciting news for muscle car fans as Dodge officially reveals prices for its first EV, the 2024 Dodge Charger Daytona. Dodge's first electric car, the 2024 Dodge Charger Daytona EV, will launch in two high-performance trim levels. The first, Dodge Charger Daytona RT with standard direct connection stage one upgrade, will start at $59,995, excluding a $19.95 destination fee. With that stage one upgrade, the electric Dodge Charger packs 496 horsepower and 404 pound-feet of torque. Dodge claims the base model can hit 0-60 to in 4.7 seconds and includes a sport suspension for an improved feel on the road. The range-topping scat pack trim includes custom drive modes like track, drag, and custom. You can also select different race options, including launch control and donut mode. The electric 2024 Dodge Daytona models look, drive, and feel like a Dodge, according to the brand CEO, Matt McClear. Starting at 73190, the 2024 Dodge Charger Daytona EV Scat Pack model will be equipped with Direct Connection Stage 2 upgrade. The upgrades for those come straight for the factory and up the horsepower to 670 and torque to 627. Dodge claims the Scat Pack model maintains its throne as, quote, the world's quickest and most powerful muscle car. With SRT-like performance, the Dodge Charger Daytona EV Scat Pack model will sprint from 0 to 60 in 3.3 seconds. I'm a big fan of Mopar. I'm a big Dodge guy. I'm really excited about the Wraith and other ridiculous movies from the 80s that painted Mopar in a very positive light for me as an individual. That said, world's quickest and most powerful muscle car is a very, very narrow distinction. As I would say to my friend, John, I think that's slicing it pretty thin when you consider that Tesla's Model S, Model 3, in fact, are quicker than this. I think that I would put a Kia EV6 next to this at a drag strip and perform relatively well. So calling this a muscle car, I think that is a very antiquated term that specifically only applies to Camaro, Mustang, and Challenger, Charger in this case. And I think that they're doing that specifically because they know that in 2024, a zero to 60 time of 3.3 seconds just isn't that impressive, trailing a number of Teslas and Lucids and other models by a full second to 60 and probably even more at the quarter mile. That said, if your notion of a fast car involves a 426 Hemi, this will be plenty fast for you. But This is not the only exciting sporty car news from a legacy brand today. Volkswagen has launched its sportiest EV yet, but Peter Johnson asks, can it keep pace with the Golf GTI? Volkswagen introduced its upgraded ID3 with more power, a finely tuned drive system, and sleek design elements. Quote, with its spontaneous and superior power delivery, the new ID3 GTX performance is, for me, the electric counterpart to our sporty compact car icon, the Golf GTI Club Sport. That's according to VW's board member for development, Kai Grunitz. According to Grunitz, the hot hatch, quotes, shares the same fascinating lightness when they accelerate. The new EV is the first model to feature the improved Volkswagen performance drive system. With that, the new ID3 GTX performance packs 321 horsepower, fully 40 more than the GTX model. With up to 545 newton meters of torque, Volkswagen says the performance EV exceeds the drive power of its most powerful V6 turbocharged engines. Now, looking at this car, it very much mimics that sort of design language that we've come to see from the ID4 in the U.S., the ID5 overseas. It's got a, a very clean interior that I am blocking and try to get out of the way. It's got a good mix of buttons and touchscreens there. Very clean, very modern, very simple. I like the uh, red contrast stitching there. I think this is a very interesting take on the hot hatch. I think it does speak to Volkswagen's forward-looking design philosophy here. I think it would have been much easier for Volkswagen to do something like the Hyundai Ionic 5, create something that looks a little more visually similar to that iconic VW Rabbit GTI from the late 70s, early 80s. But uh, hey, they're not selling cars to me. Moving away from the legacy auto brands, Tesla releases a new safety report claiming an improvement in autopilot crashes. Now, obviously, that doesn't mean the crashes are better and more exciting. That means that there's less of them. For years, Tesla used to release a vehicle safety report that tracks miles between accidents in its vehicles based on the level of autopilot used or not used and comparing it to the industry average. 
The automaker used that report to claim that its autopilot technology resulted in a safer driving experience and that its vehicles would crash far less often than the average car in the U.S., even without autopilot. The data was always limited and criticized, writes Fred Lambert, for not taking into account that accidents are most common on city roads and undivided roads than on highways, where autopilot is most commonly used. But it was the only data that Tesla was willing to release about its autopilot feature, and therefore was still useful to track progress. Today, the automaker released its safety report for Q4 of 24. Quote, in the second quarter, we recorded one crash for every 6.88 million miles driven in which drivers were using autopilot technology. For drivers who were not using autopilot technology, we recorded one crash for every 1.4 million miles driven. By comparison, the most recent data available from NHTSA and FHWA from 2022 shows that in the United States, there was an automobile crash approximately every 670,000 miles. This is a decrease in miles between crashes quarter over quarter, but it is better to look at it year over year due to the fact accidents are more frequent depending on the season. The top comment by Blank Point so far, this is useless information. Non-AP miles are from cars driven in all weather and road conditions. Tesla's autopilot only works in well-marked roads and optimal weather conditions, and the U.S. average also includes older vehicles. I think that's a fair criticism. I think that this is a very worthwhile thing to talk about. I think this is an incredibly valid point to bring up. The fact that autopilot only works in what I think could be called ideal conditions in especially dark weather, foggy weather, rainy weather, urban weather, snowy weather, when there's ice on the road, obscuring the lane lines and lane markings, the system is not going to work at all. So eliminating all of those variables and all those conditions doesn't necessarily paint a picture of safety. It just paints a picture that says under ideal conditions, you're less likely to crash than in more treacherous conditions. And I think we already knew that we didn't need data to back that up, but here we are anyway. Now, if you think Tesla safety report stinks, apparently the whole car can start to stink like cheesy feet. And that is according to Michelle Lewis, who uh, writes, if your Tesla starts to stink like old sweat socks, you can fix that problem yourself, but it's a bit of a daunting process. Now, she's obviously talking about the cabin filter. She writes here, I procrastinated dealing with it, but when it became unbearable, I eventually figured it out after talking to one of our colleagues, Jamie Dow, that's because of the infamous ongoing air filter problem in the Teslas. She's never had this putrid air filter experience in any other car, EV, or otherwise. Now, I want to leap to Tesla's defense here, and you guys know I don't do that often, but if you don't change the cabin filter in a modern car, especially with all the stuff that goes through that filter, all of the exterior air being drawn in, filtered through HEPA filters for pollen and carbon and things like that. If you've never had a car that had a serious cabin filtration system like this, like a Volvo or Mercedes Benz, this can seem like a new thing, but this has been around and this has been a problem, I think, with premium brands for a long time. If you leave that cabin filter in there for too long, it gets real funky and nasty real quick. Now, Tesla's air filters are responsible for purifying the air inside the car's cabin, just like cabin filters and all these brands that I mentioned. And over time, they get clogged with dust, debris, and pollutants that leads to less effective air purification. And while Tesla recommends that the cabin filters are changed every two years, the stink actor actually arrived for Michelle months before the two-year mark. And I think that's a fair thing as well. If you're driving in places where it's humid, you live near the water, where there's a ton of humidity, if you live in the Southeast, you live in Florida, you're in the wetlands, you're going to have more air, you're going to have more impurities, more pollen in the air. And that's just going to make it so that the filter doesn't last as long as if you lived in Phoenix or something. I think that two years, an average mark, totally defending Tesla on this one, mark it down August 7th. It probably won't happen again for another year. We'll see. Tesla's decision to put the onus of replacing the air filters on owners sets it apart from other automakers. That's true. The DIY approach can be daunting for some owners who prefer a more hands-off relationship with their cars or lack the technical know-how to carry out the task themselves. Michelle does a great job walking through the step-by-step -step. if you're a Tesla owner and it's time to change your cabin filter or you just want to know what that's all about. She does a good job breaking that down. I think a better job than a lot of YouTube videos do. She's got some links in there as well. Definitely worth checking out the article. 
Now, speaking of Michelle, she wrote an article a few weeks back about how a Silverado EV costs as much to lease as a pair of Rivian trucks. And now in response, Chevy has slashed the 2024 Silverado EV lease price by fully $400 a month. The 2024 Chevy Silverado EV can now be leased for $9.99 a month for 36 months with 6819 due at signing. That's based on an MSRP of $96,495 for the RST and 10,000 miles a year. Before the offer took effect on August 1st, Cars Direct reported that the Silverado EV was advertised at $1,449 for 39 months with $4,099 due at signing. The truck's effective cost was previously $1,554 a month. Before that, it was $1,595. Now, however, the 2024 Silverado leases at just $1,188 a month, a price cut of $407 per month since the truck was launched. GM's lease interest rate also has improved, and it's dropped back down to 7.22% after being raised to 85 at the end of July. This is the best price to date on the Silverado EV, and there are still better deals to be had. For example, 2024 GMC Hummer EV is now listed at $849 for 36 months with $4,800 due at signing. That makes the Hummer EV $206 per month less expensive to lease than the Silverado EV, despite an MSRP of around $2,300 higher. Now, I just want to stop. Let's hit the brakes for a second and talk about how bananas it is that a Chevy Silverado from the Bowtie brand that's supposed to be the truck and car that every man in America, hardworking person can work, get a job and afford. This Chevy was always kind of the everyman brand. And I'm using that term in a gender neutral sense, right? So just like lay off that one. But $96,000 is nearly double the average transaction price of a new car, which is still a staggering $48,644, especially when you consider that the average income of an American person, American household is less than the average price of a new car. So now we're talking about take all the money that the average American makes, that the average full-time employed American makes, which is like 49,000, something like that, maybe even 45,000 once you start taking out the top 0.5%, you get that number you double it, you're still not at the price of a Silverado EV RST. And that shocking sticker price is not just on the Silverado EV. Even the gas Silverados are crazy expensive. I did this search before coming online today. I tried to get the least expensive, fewest features. What was the cheapest Silverado that I could buy? And the MSRP on the cheapest Silverado that I could actually get was $41,295. Now that's a theoretical. If you actually look at vehicles in the inventory, the cheapest is $43,410. That is insane. This Silverado is a massive profit leader for General Motors, the same way that an F-150 is for Ford, the same way that that Ram Classic is for Stellantis. They are just milking the profits out of these trucks as much as they possibly can. And like, on the one hand, it's capitalism, right? Don't hate the player, hate the game. Good for them. Let them get all the money they can. That's great. But on the other hand, it does raise the question of whether or not anybody should really be buying these vehicles. If you're a commercial fleet, you've got a campus to manage. You are a forest preserve. You're in a municipality, a small village, even a, a city where you're not driving at highway speeds. Do you really need a pickup truck like a Chevy Silverado for $43,000? Or do you need something like this club car urban? Now, I wrote this article a few weeks ago, and I stand by everything that I said in it. This is a vehicle that effectively runs and drives like a golf cart, right? It's got 25 mile an hour top speed. It'll get you around town. It'll get you around a city. It's got a payload capacity of more than 2,200 pounds. This 2,200 four pound payload capacity on the club car urban UTV is nearly 400 pounds more capacity than the Ford Ranger, which is a much larger, more expensive vehicle and about the same as Chevy's full size Silverado 1500. It's plenty of truck, in other words, more than enough to get tools, parts, plants, sods, whatever else you need across a campus or an industrial park. And I'm not the only person who thinks that way. Obviously, the president of Club Car thinks that way. Today, most campus operation teams use pickup trucks to address their facility management needs, says Jeff Dominski, the VP of product management at Club Car. The pickup is the wrong tool 
for many jobs. A blended fleet of traditional pickups and electric utility vehicles would improve operational productivity while lowering ownership costs and reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Look, nothing could be more accurate, right? You see it time and time again. You see all these yahoos out there driving around in their big old pickup trucks, and they got nothing in the back but an inch of wax and a bed full of sailboat fuel. Now, that's air for those of you who can't do that math. The vast majority of pickup trucks today in 2024 in North America are being used as passenger vehicles. They're taking the role of the personal luxury coupe from the 70s and 80s. They're taking up that Ford Thunderbird, that Lincoln Mark, that Cadillac Eldorado role. What you see is guys driving to work by themselves in a 6,000 pound pickup truck time and time and time again. And that is not what is needed, certainly not what a commercial fleet, what a business enterprise needs to move people and things around a city or around a village. Quote, our industrial and commercial customers looking for safe on-road transportation that is street legal, 100% electric, and low cost. That's from Club Car President Mark Wagner. And if that's the solution they're looking to solve for, they will find the urban UTV to be the ideal fit. Couldn't agree more. Would love to hear what you think in the comments. And that is all I've got today for August 7th, 2024. Be sure to like and subscribe, and we'll see you tomorrow.